Perseverance of the saints is the last point of TULIP. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. I used to think, well, I am a two-point Calvinist, and there's lots of folks that say, I'm a one-point, I'm a two-point, I'm a three-point, I'm a four-point, I'm a four-and-a-half-point, I heard a guy say one time. Um, I thought I believed in total depravity, because to me, total depravity meant that man cannot do anything to save himself. That's true. I cannot save my soul. I cannot contribute to the saving of my soul. Okay, that's true. But the Calvinist goes farther and says that you cannot even understand and believe the gospel. Okay, they believe you're totally incapable of faith unless God gives it to you sovereignly. Um, I also thought that I believed in perseverance of the saints because I thought perseverance of the saints was the same thing as eternal security. And I do believe in eternal security. If you trust Christ as your Savior, He gives you everlasting life. You are born into the family of God. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, and He seals you into the body of Christ, and you cannot ever possibly be lost. Okay? Because God does those wonderful things for every person that gets saved, every person that trusts in Christ. Okay? I believe in eternal security. Uh, Baptists are often criticized because we say, once saved, always saved. Okay? It happens to be biblical, though. Okay? And it's something we don't need to run away from or be embarrassed about. We believe it because God has said it. Perseverance of the saints, though, is different. Okay, let me give you a definition of perseverance of the saints. Those who were chosen by God before the foundation of the world, that's the election part, those who were chosen by God before the foundation of the world and given the grace to believe will persevere which means continue or endure to the end of their lives in faith and the good works that saving faith produces. Okay, so if God chose you, you know, if God, you know, any, meeny, miny, mo, I pick you. Okay, if God chose you, then you will persevere to the end of your life in the kind of a good life, you will continue to believe and you will produce the good works that come from saving faith. Okay? That's perseverance of the saints. You can never do, you cannot fall away from believing and you cannot do anything bad enough that you could possibly lose your salvation. Okay, that's perseverance of the saints, basically. Um, now, since this is based on the eternal decrees of God, okay, remember, God made a choice in eternity past. There's 7 billion people alive today. Let's suppose that 10 or 12 or 15 billion people have lived on the face of the earth throughout history, somewhere around there. Out of those, say, 10 billion people, God looked down and He said, okay, I pick you and 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 the rest, I made sinners, but they're going to go to hell. They don't have a chance, they don't have a choice, because only the people that I chose can go to heaven. Well, if God chose you, okay, if God chose Brooks and he says, you are one of the elect, I am going to redeem you, Christ is going to die for you, and I am going to sovereignly regenerate you and give you the gift of faith, you are going to exercise that faith in Christ, 
and you will never, ever, ever possibly, because I chose you, you cannot fall away. Okay, well that sounds like, and if it all depends on a decision God made before He created the world, then I should be able to have assurance of my salvation. I should be able to rejoice. Heaven is guaranteed. I know I'm going to heaven and I should be able to rejoice in my assurance. But it doesn't work that way in Calvinism. Okay? I have assurance of salvation because God has made wonderful promises in the Bible and God cannot lie. I know I'm going to heaven because God is honest. Okay? I know it. But a Calvinist has a problem. John Piper. Now, this is a quote from a fellow named Bob Wilkin, who is the head of the Grace Evangelical Society, which is not in favor of Calvinism. Um, he attended a meeting with John Piper. And he heard John Piper say this, and he wrote it down, and he's published it. John Piper, who is a very well-known, world, worldwide known Calvinist. He said that no Christian, no Christian can be sure that he is a true believer. Hence there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord and deny ourselves so that we might make it. Okay? Now, why is it that no believer can be sure? Are you still a sinner? I am still a sinner. Well then, how can I be sure that I'm not one of those who fall away? And under Calvinism, if you fall away, that is simply evidence that you were never really saved at all. You were not elected. Were you there when God elected who to save? You weren't. Is there a list somewhere that God has written down and you can find your name on it? No, there's not. So how do you know you're elect? I witnessed to a guy one time. Um, he happened to be a Lutheran. And Lutherans will say, well, we're not Calvinists because we came before Calvin. Um, Okay, but they believe a lot of the same things. Anyway, this fellow, he quoted, I was amazed, he quoted Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 to me. Okay, he said he believed in justification by faith, and he quoted Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and it says it's not of works, it's, it's all by grace, through faith, and so on. I had asked him, do you know you're going to heaven? And he said, no. And I said, how is it that you understand what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 mean, but you don't have assurance of eternal life? And he says, because I don't know if I'm one of the elect. The only way you can know if you're elected is by living right. And guess what? None of us always lives right. Okay? If it... You see, the thing is, it still depends on you. A lot of Calvinists don't really believe in salvation by grace because it still depends on you. If you don't live right, you never had it. So what's, what's the solution to that? Go back and believe again? No, the solution to that is live better. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to work your way to heaven. A lot of Calvinists are not saved because they're trying to work their way to heaven. Um, okay, John Piper went on. Uh, this is something that he wrote. Um, we must own up to the fact that our final salvation is made contingent upon the subsequent obedience which comes from faith. Now con contingent means dependent. Okay, our salvation depends on subsequent obedience. And if we don't obey sufficiently, 
And how on earth do we know what's enough? Okay, if we don't obey well enough, then it simply proves that in eternity past, when God was choosing who to save, He passed us over. And He didn't pick us. Okay, so does a Calvinist have assurance of salvation? Does a Calvinist know they're going to heaven? An awful lot of them don't. And they're trying to work their way to heaven. Um, Calvinism, Arminianism, which is supposedly the opposite of Calvinism, and Lordship Salvation, which is a method of preaching the gospel that says that you have to not only trust Christ as Savior, but you have to submit yourself completely <coughs> to His Lordship, to His mastery. Okay, you have to yield to Him. At the time you get saved, you have to yield to Him as your master. These things all teach the same thing. Without good works, you're not going to heaven. And yet the Scripture teaches that salvation is not based on good works at all. Not before you get saved, not after you get saved. They don't count at all toward your salvation. They will count for a believer, for a born-again person. They'll count for your fellowship with God. They'll count for how God rewards you and how He blesses you, that kind of thing. But they don't get you to heaven. Okay, uh, I've got a whole lot of Scripture here. And we have just covered one page out of four, I think. Uh, so we better move. Uh, Romans chapter 3, starting with verse 20, and this is a message that, I mean, this could be divided into about three different sermons, and I'm going to give it about five minutes, maybe. Okay, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law of Moses simply proves you're a sinner. It doesn't save you. It doesn't justify you. It proves you can't get to heaven by keeping it. Um, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Predicted ahead of time that God would save people not by our righteousness, but by His righteousness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. God saves those who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, we all have the same problem. We're sinners. And there's only one way of salvation, and that is the righteousness of God, which is credited to those of us who believe in Christ. Um, being justified freely by His grace. You cannot earn it. It's a gift. Okay? Freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How can God save a sinner? Because Christ died and paid for our sin. That's how. Okay? It's got nothing to do with how good you are. The fact is, God looks down at us and He says, they're all sinners. Okay? There's no difference. You say, but I'm better than my neighbor. God doesn't think so. Okay? God says, you're all the same. You've all got a sin problem. And I will take away the sin with the blood of Christ. And all you have to do is believe. Um, verse 25. Whom God hath set forth, this is Jesus, has been set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfactory payment through faith in His blood. You see, you have to believe in the blood. It's not enough that Jesus, you've also got to believe in it. Okay? You've got to believe His blood paid for your sin. To declare His righteousness for the remission, the forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. God forgives your sin because He gives to you His righteousness. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. God saves people who put their faith in Christ. Where is boasting then? Can you brag about what God has done? You can brag about God, but you can't brag about yourself because you didn't save yourself. It's excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith excludes boasting. 
Therefore, okay, this is an extremely important verse. Okay, therefore, we conclude. Here's the conclusion. How do you get to heaven? Here's the conclusion. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay? Not even good deeds that come after you trust Christ. Okay? It's not that God says, okay, you believe in Christ, I'll save your soul. Now if you'll do these good things, you'll stay saved. No. You're justified, you're declared righteous, you're declared not guilty by God by faith, without good works. Okay, Romans 4, 5, 4, 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you work your way to heaven, salvation is not by grace. If you work your way to heaven, you're saying, God owes me. God owes me. I have been good, I have obeyed Him, I have kept the commandments, I have been baptized, I have done this and this and this and this. Therefore, God owes me a spot in heaven. Okay? There are people who think that they are going to have a mansion in glory on streets of gold because they gave money to a church and it wouldn't even buy them a house in Davenport but they think it's going to buy them a place in heaven. That is stupid. Okay? God doesn't owe you anything. It's all God's grace. It's all God's goodness bestowed on you who is undeserving. I tell you, I praise God it's the way it is. Because I wouldn't have a chance. Okay? I wouldn't have a chance. There's no way in the world I could get to heaven by being good. And most people out there understand this. Okay? And an awful lot of them, they gave up on trying to be good a long time ago. Have you had people tell you, well, I'm going to hell anyway. I may as well live it up. Okay? And a lot of folks, to some of them, that's just a joke. Okay? But a lot of them, they, they mean that. Okay? They know they can't make it, so... Well, I'm going to hell forever. I may as well have a little fun on the way. Praise God, we can say, no, you don't have a chance. But God loved you so much, He gave His Son to die for you so that you can go to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. Not your good works, not changing your life, not turning from all your sin, but place your faith in Christ. Believe in Him. Okay. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Okay, this applies, this, this idea of salvation by grace through faith alone, it applies to getting and keeping salvation. Okay, getting and keeping salvation. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You've got reservations in heaven. Okay? If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you have a place reserved for you. You have salvation that is reserved, it is kept, it is guarded, it is protected for you. It is incorruptible, it's undefiled, it cannot. It cannot rot, it cannot decay, it cannot fall apart, it cannot wear out, okay? It's there forever, waiting for you, who are kept by your good works and persistence in living a godly life. It doesn't say that. You are kept by the power of God. God not only saved you, he keeps you, okay? Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you know there's a whole lot more to salvation than what you and I have got right now? Okay, we are as saved as we will ever be. But the day is going to come that we're going to be in glory where there will be no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no death, no fatigue, 
How many of you woke up this morning and you just jumped out of bed and you say, glory, hallelujah, it's wonderful. To... Huh? Anybody? I didn't. I woke up this morning thinking, what is that noise? Oh, yeah, it's my phone beeping at me. And I had to find it because I was in Joe and Dana's bedroom. I wasn't in my bedroom at home. The, at home, the phone's right there. But this one I had to plug in across the room, and I'm stumbling in the dark. Where's the phone? Okay? Ah, oh, anyhow. We're kept by the power of God. Kept by God. Okay? We, we don't have to worry about it. Um... 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, and we're covering these things super fast, but not fast enough according to the clock. Um, My little children, these things, have I, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, God doesn't want you to sin. You're a born-again person. You're God's child. He doesn't want you to sin. He wants you to live a godly life. But then he says, and if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who paid for your sins. He is your defense attorney. Okay? Now, okay, let's, let's look at some more verses here, and then we'll, we'll explain what this means. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. God has predestinated, if you've trusted Christ, someday you're going to be in heaven just like Christ. Okay, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, He also called. Those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He glorified. See, in the sight of God, you're already glorified in heaven. Okay, that's how safe and secure you are. In the sight of God, you're glorified in heaven. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now the next verse, Revelation 12.10, talks about the devil and how he's cast out of heaven finally. And it says at the end of that verse, the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Okay, now Romans 8.23 says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The answer is there is somebody. He accuses us every day. The devil sees our sin and he says, and he's a Christian? He's going to heaven? And what happens? Jesus is seated right at the right hand of the throne of God and he is our defender. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. He's sitting there and he's saying, Father, it's okay. I paid for that sin. Okay? I saved his soul. I gave him everlasting life. Okay? Yeah, he messes up occasionally, but he's a child of God. Okay? The devil accuses us. Jesus defends us. Okay? So we're still going to heaven. Should we do wrong? No, we shouldn't do wrong. Okay? But the gospel doesn't change. Christ died and paid for our our sins. And we know we're going to heaven because of what He has done. Okay. Um, John 10, 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life. This is talking about His sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. Okay? I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Jesus is hanging on to us. And then around His hand is the Father's hand. Okay, we are doubly safe, doubly secure. Some of you have little kids. When you go into a store, 
that is just chock full of expensive knickknacks. Okay, you just let your kids run loose, right? You don't, you don't, there you go. Smart, okay? Now, when you go into a store like that with a child, okay, what do you do? A lot of, you, you see a lot of folks, they, they reach a finger down and let the child hang on, right? And you walk around like that. But when you go into a store full of breakable stuff, you grab that hand, I mean, you've got them like this, you know? And you're not going to let them go for anything because if you let them go, you're going to be buying stuff that's already broken. <laughs> okay? God, he, he's not reaching down a finger, trusting us to hang on. He has a hold of us. Okay? He will never, ever let go. We are safe and secure because it's God doing not just the initial saving, but the keeping. All right? And the devil says, look at that, what he did. And Jesus says, Father, I paid for that. It's under the blood. It's washed away. All right? And so eventually, if you know Christ as Savior, you're going to heaven. You're going to see Jesus and be transformed to be just like him. And it's going to be glorious forever and ever and ever. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. Okay. John 6, 37 to 40. Uh, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Christ will not throw you out. Okay. No matter what you do, he will not throw you out. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me. So here's God's will for Christ. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. He's not going to lose anybody. He's not going to throw you out, and he's not going to lose you. But he will raise you up at the last day. You are going through the resurrection of the dead. And live with him forever. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, I know I'm going to heaven because God promised me I'm going to heaven. All right. Um, what about assurance of salvation? Now, I've given you another verse here that. Uh, the, the Calvinist, the Lord Shipper, says you can only know you're going to heaven by a changed life. Now you take that only out. That only is a problem. Okay? I want you to think back to when you first got saved. Was there a difference in your life when you first got saved? For most people there is some degree of difference of some sort. Um, I trusted Christ. I, lived, I was in a family that we almost never went to church. Okay, I went to a certain youth fellowship on Sunday nights because there were girls there and we played music and we danced. Okay, and after a while I decided these girls, there's not enough girls, they're not pretty enough, I'll just, you know, I'll go somewhere else. Okay, but then I got saved and all of a sudden our family's going to church three times a week. And guess what? We loved it. It was fantastic. Now, not every Christian feels that or has that experience, but some do. Um, you know what? One of the main, main things that showed me I was, there was a difference that I was saved? The chastening hand of God. Because I was still doing some of the bad stuff that I did before I got saved. Before I got saved, it didn't even bother me. Or rarely, anyway, bothered me. But when I got saved, every time I did those things, I felt terrible. Okay? And it was, the Spirit of God was convicting me. Bad things were happening in my life. Uh, one time I, I knew, I mean, it's, you know how it is. God speaks to you. You don't hear a voice. Okay? It's not, Mike, I want you to... No. 
But God speaks. And this one time I was supposed to do a certain thing. Go to a, a, a Christian event. And I didn't go. Because I was in the scouts. And there was a, a camp out, a, a, a trip down a river, and a camp out that weekend. And I chose the camp out. And you know what? Canoe trip down this river. I lost my glasses. I ruined my watch. I had never been in a canoe before in my life. Okay? On this one hand, I had eight blisters. <laughs> okay? This canoe trip was absolutely miserable. And the whole time that I'm on this trip, I'm thinking, I shouldn't even be here. Okay? I ought to be at this other place, fellowshipping with Christian people instead of hanging around with all my lost friends, having a horrible time. Okay? The chastening of God is an evidence of salvation. Good changes in your life are also an evidence of salvation. What if you don't have good things to point to? Then, and guess what? There are times in your life that you probably won't have a bunch of good stuff. Oh, Lord, look what I'm doing for you. No, you don't have that sometimes. But then you go back to the Bible. And you say, but God promised me. God told me that I was going to heaven. Can a changed life help with your assurance? Yes, it can. But when you don't have a changed life, you still have the Word of God. Okay, and that is what's important because you can't count on your changes. Okay, there's days that you feel like, man, I'm really going strong for the Lord. And the next day, you're kicking yourself over the latest stupid things you did. All right, okay, um, believing God's promises, Hebrews 11 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. A substance and evidence are translated assurance, confidence, conviction. Okay, faith means we believe God. We trust Him. We take Him at His word. God has spoken and said we're going to heaven. Shouldn't we believe that? Shouldn't we have confidence in our salvation because God has said so? That's what faith is. Okay? Um, 1 John 5, 13. And this is my favorite of all the verses on assurance. And there's a lot of them. We've seen several already. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Um, I want you to look at this verse. These things have I written unto you that believe. Okay, this verse is not written to everybody. This is a verse that is written exclusively to people who believe on the name of the Son of God. They believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, now we know faith in Christ means that you've trusted Him to save your soul. You believe He is God in the flesh, who died on the cross, paid for your sins, was raised from the dead, and has offered you the gift of eternal life. And you trust Him as your Savior. Okay? So this verse is written to people who have done that. They have understood the gospel, they've understood who Jesus is and what He did, and they have trusted Him to save their soul. So, when I talk to people, and let me ask you, is this verse written to you? Okay? Is this verse written to you? When, when God inspired John to write, these things have I written unto you. Okay? Did He have you in mind? Okay? Is this verse written to you? 
You believe in the name of the Son of God. So he says that if this is written to you, that you may, here's the reason for the verse, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, there's two four-letter words in that verse that are very important. He says, you may know. You may know. He doesn't say you may hope. He doesn't say you may think. He doesn't say you may pray. He doesn't say you may try harder. Okay, he says, no, you may know, K-N-O-W, okay, know that you have, four-letter word that's very important. Um, okay, I've got a pen here in my pocket. I have this pen. Does that mean I'm going to get it tomorrow? Does it mean I'm going to get it 10 years from now? Am I going to get it when I die? No, I have it. Present tense. It's mine right now. So he says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you may know, not doubt, worry, fear. You may know that you right now have what? Eternal life. Well, how long is eternal? Forever. If something is eternal, um, okay, who owns a Ford pickup? Anybody here? Ah, we got some Ford pickup drivers. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> most popular vehicle in the history of the United States forever, practically. Okay. How long do they last? Forever. <laughs> Not quite. Some of them go an awful long time, but they all break down eventually. Right? They all have to be replaced. It's not a forever pickup truck. Okay? It's not eternal. It wears out. It has to be thrown away. It's going to end up in a junkyard someday or a museum or something. Okay? The life that God gave us lasts forever. You have it right now, and if it ever ends, God lied to you in the first place because He didn't give you eternal life. Now, God cannot lie. And if He says eternal life, it has to last forever. Okay? You get this? So if you believe in Jesus Christ, God has written a promise to you that you may know that you have right now and will have forever life. Okay? Are you going to heaven when you die? If you believe in Christ, the answer is yes. Okay? Not because I said it, because God said it. Okay? If I wrote this, it'd be worthless. But God wrote it. And He says, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you may have absolute assurance that you're going to heaven and you can never lose it. Do you know you're going to heaven? Christ died for you and paid for your sins. Okay, we talked earlier about His righteousness saving us. Let this hand represent you and me. Let my wallet represent our sin. We're all sinners. There's not a person in the world who is without sin. The only one who ever was was Jesus Christ. Okay, God loves you. He hates your sin. He wants you to go to heaven. To go to heaven, the sin has to be gone. Okay, completely, totally gone. Not a little gone. It's not good enough to do better. Okay, you have to be perfect. Well, if you are perfect from here on out, what about what you did wrong yesterday? And the day before, you see you're already behind the eight ball. You don't have a chance. And that's the truth. You don't have a chance. Except because God loved you, 
he sent his son and let this represent Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, he came to the earth, he lived a perfect life, he went to the cross to take your sin away, to take my sin away, to take the sin of the whole world away. He was raised from the dead, the sin is gone, the sin is paid for on Calvary. And he says that if you will simply believe in him, just trust him, he will give you his righteousness, okay? You can't see my right hand now because it's inside my left. That's the way it is with us in Christ. God doesn't look at us and see our sin because the sin was taken away and the righteousness of Christ has been credited to us. And he sees us clothed in the righteousness of his own son. And that'll get us to heaven. Okay? And we can know that right now. That's a marvelous thing. Mm -hmm.